Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to welcome you all to the second EVPA policy webinar of the year. Today's topic will be about COVID-19 and the EU response to how sure will Europe be. My name is Bianca Polidoro. I am EVPA policy manager and I will be moderating this webinar. Given the high level of participation today's session, we have over 100 registered participants. We will be keeping the participants to the webinar muted in order to avoid noise, interferences, but we encourage you all to raise any questions you might have. You can find the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen, and you can write your question in the questions section at any point. Please do not forget to clearly mention to whom you would like to address it. The last part of today's webinar will consist of a Q&A session during which we will address your questions to the panelists. If for some reason your question has not been answered during the webinar, feel free to contact us via email afterwards and we will ensure the necessary follow-up. Last but not least, know that this session is being recorded, so you will soon be able to watch the recording and consult this presentation on EVPS website. Now that these housekeeping details are clear, let me give you a quick word about the European Venture Philanthropy Association. EVPA is a membership organization currently gathering more than 300 members from all across Europe that are interested in or are practicing venture philanthropy and social investments. Our members include foundations, social investors, academic financial institutions, and service providers. Our policy work relies on two pillars. First, as thought leader within the impact space, EVPA monitors and communicates important development in the sector at the European and national level, and voices the concerns and expectations of its network to policymakers. Second, as catalyst, EVPA connects relevant stakeholders and facilitates conversation and collaboration between them on key policy topics. Through our policy webinar series, we have reached more than 1,000 people since 2014, connecting policymakers and practitioners around key policy developments, such as social impact bonds and public procurement. If you are interested in these topics, all recording and presentation are available on our website. At the end of this webinar, a short survey will pop up on your screen. We would greatly appreciate if you could take two minutes to fill this in. It's also an opportunity to let us know about a specific policy topic you would like us to address in our policy webinar series. So don't hesitate to grab it. Today's topic is COVID-19 and the EU response. How sure will Europe be? We will discuss this topic with three great speakers. Matteo Duiella, economist specialized in labor market and social policies working at the G Employment in the European Commission. Karel van der Forsen, policy officer social economy at DG Grow in the European Commission. Cristina San Salvador. Expansion and Program Development Manager in ship to be ship to be is a foundation that accelerates and invests on social entrepreneurship projects in Spain. Let me introduce you to the webinar agenda. First of all, I will give you a short introduction on one of the programs that the European Commission built to face the economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, the support to mitigate unemployment risks in emergency SURE program. Then Matteo Duiella will continue the overview on the SURE program, highlighting the priorities and the challenges of the European labor market. Afterwards, Karel van der Poorten will focus on crude and match funding as one of the social economy, economy financial response to the recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Then Cristina San Salvador will delve into the challenges faced by practitioners, sharing the best practices in confronting the current coronavirus pandemic. At the end of these three presentations, I will leave the floor to my colleague, Catalina, who will facilitate the Q&A session with the speakers. We will finish this webinar with an EVPA conclusion. Now, before leaving the floor to our first speaker, I would like to give you a short introduction. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has deep economic consequences, which are and will affect our daily life uh, and will bring several changes to the European social economy ecosystem. The EU has already showed its potential delivering a coordinated and powerful collective response to attenuate the economic blow of the coronavirus crisis. Among the programs which the European Commission <coughs> uh, set up to face this pandemic, sure, is a tangible expression of union solidarity to protect and safeguard the European citizens. 
Indeed, the SURE program will provide financial assistance to member states to address sudden increases in public expenditure for the preservation of employment. Specifically, the SURE instrument will act as a second line of defense, supporting the short-time work schemes and similar measures to help member states protect jobs and thus employees and self-employed against the risk of employment and loss of income. Now, for a detailed explanation, sure, I will leave the floor to Matteo. Matteo, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bianca, for the, uh, for the introduction and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, so I'll give a broad overview of this new instrument, uh, which has just been established. And then I'm happy to take your questions at the end of the of this webinar. If you have, uh, if you want to know more details uh, of any aspect, which or any anything that is not clear from my presentation. So uh, let me start. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, by putting this uh, this new instrument into context. So of course this is just one of the initiatives that the EU has taken. Uh, as part of its economic response to the COVID-19 crisis. Because of course, the, this is, um, uh, first of all, a sanitary crisis, but then uh, it carries with it also serious economic effects. So um, since the, the beginning, since March, uh, the European Union started uh, putting in place measures and uh, initiatives to help member states cope Listed the, the main ones, and sure, the, the new uh, instrument that I will uh, discuss today, which uh, I'll explain today, uh, it's just one of them. Uh, just let me mention a couple of other um, initiatives, um, which are, let's say, complementary to the SURE initiative. Um, so, first of all, the Coronavirus Response Investment Initiative which is also about giving support to member states to address the economic consequences of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, what this initiative did was to allow member states to reallocate the uh, available uh, funds under the cohesion policy and uh, de regional development funds and uh, European social fund. Uh, so basically all the unspent money that they had uh, not yet um, allocated, they could basically shift it. They were given the flexibility, the possibility to reallocate it to um, uh, face uh, the new challenges that, that suddenly arise uh, following the, the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, but this is about uh, basically existing money, which was already there in the EU budget. Uh, as you know, as you probably know, the EU budget is fixed on a long-term basis for a seven-year period we are in 2020 and this is the last year of the seven year of the current seven-year framework as of next year there will be a new seven-year framework that will begin so the EU budget for 2021-2027 and um, this is, has not yet been adopted uh, the commission has put forward well had put forward the proposal back in 2018 and um, just a couple of weeks well last month um, it, the, the new commission put forward a revised proposal um, of the uh, of a reinforced long-term EU budget and also the next generation EU. So additional um, the mobilization of additional resources to be spent in the first four years between 2021 and 2024 um, to deal with the, basically the, the recovery uh, from the, this current crisis. Now, sure, basically comes in between. On the one hand, it complements because it brings new resources on top of the current uh, MFF, and it serves as a bridge, basically, in practice, towards the next MFF, the multi-annual financial framework, that should start uh, from next year, uh, and uh, which has not yet been adopted. The heads of state and government will meet here in Brussels uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, to basically fight about it, <laughs> and we'll see what happens. Uh, now, going back to sure, uh, what is it about? Uh, Bianca already said it. It's a temporary instrument which has been established exclusively to deal with the uh, COVID-19 crisis, and in fact, with the um, 
the economic effects uh, or caused by the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. Um, so it has been established on the basis of Article 122 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, which is um, an article that allows the Council to take uh, particular measures, uh, the most appropriate ones, in case of a difficult economic situation, and it allows to provide support to member states who are in difficulty or are threatened with severe difficulties. Um, so it is an emergency uh, article, let's say, that allows taking emergency measures and in the spirit of solidarity between EU member states. And it only applies to EU member states, so the 27. Um, it does not apply to neighboring countries and uh, the UK now is no longer a member, so it is left out. And uh, the instrument provides financial assistance, uh, so liquidity support, uh, in other terms, loans. So this is complementary to the EU funds, which are um, which mainly give grants under the EU budget, like the European Social Fund or the. Um, so the Sure instrument will provide loans uh, to help member states. Next slide, please. Uh, to help member states uh, finance measures um who are uh, supposed to support workers preserving jobs and help companies um uh survive this difficult period so the um, as you can see from the slide the main purpose of the instrument is to provide liquidity support for the member states to finance short time work schemes and similar measures the objective the idea is that with these schemes which all member states uh, either already had or quickly put in place in response to the to the crisis, help um, preserve jobs because they allow companies uh, to retain their workers, reduce their working hours, their hours worked, and uh, these schemes provide a subsidy or um, to the workers who then does not lose all of its of their incomes, so they support the the households' incomes, and um, and basically by doing so, uh, these schemes help preserve the economic structures of the member states and in principle they prevent uh, companies from going bankrupt or unemployment to suddenly uh, increase and uh, spike uh, and then you know we know it's once you know a person is detached from from the risk being detached from the labor market and it becomes difficult to find a new employment one once uh, a job has been lost uh, so in principle uh, the reliance on these schemes should also help preventing longer lasting damage and favor so a swift recovery uh, as long as, as soon as uh, this sanitary crisis is is over uh, so this is in a nutshell what is the, the the logic behind this instrument so let me zoom in a moment on the scope of support so as already mentioned uh, support is given uh, to the member states to finance short time work schemes so, uh, you know, the more um, famous examples are the Kurzarbeitergeld in Germany or Austria, Casa Integrazione in Italy, Activité Partielle in France, uh, Chômage Temporaire uh, in Belgium and Luxembourg, uh, ERTE in Spain, etc. But uh, while these were the schemes that were already in place before this crisis, that are regularly used in these countries, they were also used to, uh, a lot during the previous 2008-2010 crisis, and, but as I mentioned already, um, all, the, all the member states, all 27 member states, um, also those who did not have these type of schemes, uh, rushed to introduce them, because basically they were the smartest, let's say, solution uh, to shelter the businesses and workers from the impact of this very peculiar crisis, which forced otherwise perfectly viable companies to shut down uh, activities and production and so forth. Um, so uh, then, in fact, the instrument, uh, the scope of the instrument is broader as it allows financing similar measures to short time work schemes. For instance, in particular, and I'll go, please, can you just go back to the previous slide? For instance, uh, measures supporting the self employed. Now, uh, here in this crisis, let's say we're uh, all affected, uh, both employees and self-employed. Um, so many member states put uh, uh, in place additional measures targeting the self-employed. So 
um, the scope of the regulation the, is quite broad and defined in generic terms to allow uh, covering a wide range of national schemes uh, with their specific designs. And then a third item was added. This was not present in the initial commission proposal, but it was added in the um, by the council during the negotiations. So the instrument will also support some health related measures. These are not exactly defined, uh, but it, the regulation mentions as an example, uh, in particular measures relating to healthcare at the workplace, health and safety at the workplace, which is sort of consistent with the overall objective of the instrument that is to preserve employment. And so basically measures that would help businesses to reopen and resume activities and um, uh, basically are, 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 let's say, coherent with the, with the overall approach of, and the objective of this instrument. So just le let me stress one thing, uh, quite important, the support given is uh, in the forms of loans to the member states. Then it is up to the member states to put in place these measures and they can design them the way they like. So the EU is not directly paying subsidies, let's say, to, to, to the workers, for instance. It all goes through the member states and at the end of the day, it is their money because these are loans, so they will have to repay back. Next slide, please. So uh, how is this financed? Um, basically, the EU, uh, I mean, the Commission on behalf of the EU, will borrow up to 100 billion euros on the financial markets. And then uh, it will give, uh, transfer these real money uh, to the member states who will have requested support, exactly the same conditions. Uh, and um, um, basically, the, the EU has a triple A rating, and so it can get very cheap um, uh, loans. So actually, technically, the, the, the Commission will issue bonds on the market, and normally it is able to get uh, very low interest rates, and so it will pass on the same, exactly the same conditions it gets to the member states. We'll then be able to finance them uh, themselves. Um, and uh, in principle, so this instrument basically, and here comes the element of solidarity, uh, is most interesting to those member states who have higher borrowing costs compared to the EU. And so basically, um, this instrument allows member states not to worry about their liquidity in order to finance these schemes, which can actually be quite costly and uh, are being extensively used, have been extensively used since uh, March this year. <clears throat> uh, now, a uh, technical thing, how can the EU borrow? Normally it cannot. Um, so in the past, uh, so unless for very specific um, objectives and the borrowings it, the EU does, they have to be guaranteed. So in the past, if you if we go back to the previous crisis, 2008-2010 crisis, where the EU uh, um, lent money with the same system of back-to-back -back loans, so borrowing on the markets and passing on uh, the proceeds to the member states, um, uh, during the last crisis uh, it um, gave loans to countries like uh, Greece, Ireland and Portugal, under the European uh, uh, financial stability mechanism. Um, but these loans were guaranteed by the margin under the uh, head, headroom, so the, um, the margin under the EU budget ceiling. Um, okay, now I can open a technical <laughs> uh, parenthesis. Uh, but basically, of the, if we take the EU budget, there's a gap between what the uh, the amount of resources that the EU can get, uh, which is basically the resources that are transferred from the member states to the, the member states agree to transfer to the EU, and the money that is actually allocated and spent. So normally there is always a margin which is unused and it is left there for emergencies. So this margin can be used as a guarantee uh, for the borrowings that the EU made. Small problem, this year in 2020, there was no margin left. So uh, the EU could not uh, borrow more money in addition to what had already borrowed in the past uh, because there was no margin left to guarantee this. Uh, all the margin was already either used up or already allocated to other programs 
uh, like the just to finance the just transition fund and the new initiatives of the of this commission so uh basically the commission came up with another idea quite novel never done before which was to ask all 27 member states to provide bilateral guarantees up to 25 billion to allow the commission to raise more money uh, so each member state voluntarily uh, agrees to give uh, a guarantee uh, proportional to its uh, size uh, and uh, altogether the total of guarantees will amount to 25 billion with these guarantees the eu can borrow go to the markets and borrow 100 billion keeping its AAA credit rating so uh, in principle if a member state receives support and then is not able to repay back then the commission will call on all the 26 other member states uh, to make use of these guarantees so that they put the money so here comes the element of solidarity um, all 27 member states are guaranteeing uh, each other's each, uh, each other um, using the eu as a vehicle to transfer uh, and pass on this um, AAA credit rating um, okay I hope it's clear. If not, I'm happy to, to come back to this uh, in the Q&A session. Then very quickly, the, in terms of procedure, uh, member state, a member state, I just put a random flag because I'm Italian, but don't. Uh, uh, member states can decide to request financial assistance. Basically, they have to show that they had a sudden and severe increase in the type of expenditure that we're talking about then the commission consults with the member states assesses that indeed there has been a sudden increase in this type of expenditure and then submits a proposal to the council to issue a decision to grant this financial assistance this decision specifies the terms of the loan um, the assessment of compliance with this triggering condition that you know the, the the country effectively has been hit by a shock and is taking measures to to help the workers and a description of what these measures are to make sure that they are compatible with the purposes of the regulation uh, once this is the c council decision is issued then uh, the commission at that stage can uh, sign form a loan agreement with the member states can at that point go to the markets issue the bonds get collect the money and give it to the member states um, so just um, to conclude this instrument, as I said, it's temporary. It's just for this uh, crisis. So it will normally expire at the end of 2022, unless the council decides that the COVID-19 crisis for some reason is still not over, and then the validity of the instrument can be prolonged. Uh, um, I think every six months now, uh, so there will be a, yet another a new decision, but in principle, the, the instrument will stop, stop um, uh being available at, at the latest at the end of 2022 um and uh last important remark the proposal was adopted on this uh pro sorry the proposal was put forward at the beginning of april it was the regulation was adopted by the council on the 19th of may now in this moment we are waiting to collect all the bilateral guarantees from the member states and the instrument will become active so uh, it will be possible to uh, start this whole procedure that you see in this slide and ultimately then the, for the commission will be able to grant the financial assistance to the member states that will request it only once all 27 member states will have given their bilateral guarantees um, so unfortunately this is taking a bit of time because in some member states, uh, the procedures are quite lengthy. A parliamentary vote is needed, possibly two. Uh, so it's taking a few weeks. Uh, so the financial, the instrument formally is established, but it's not yet active. And now we are um, basically getting prepared uh, for when this moment comes. Thanks a lot, and uh, I hope I stayed within the given time, allotted time. Yes, thank you very much for this detailed overview, Matteo. And uh, I would like to remind the audience that you already have the possibility to write your questions in the control panel on the right hand side of your screen. So please uh, do it. Thank you very much. And now, um, Karel, the floor is yours. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, also, thank you to Matteo because I think I can nicely bridge uh, from from uh, Matteo's presentation towards um, social economy and, and COVID-19. But first, um, I will uh, give you a short uh, introduction in what happens afterwards huh? because Matteo uh, focused on, on uh, let's say, the emergency uh, measures to, to help member states and to help uh, uh, companies and workers uh, to overcome the crisis, but um, in the meantime, the Commission in May has also proposed the, the recovery package um, and to mobilize the necessary investments for recovery. Um, the Commission will do that, as Matteo already highlighted, in two ways. Um, so the, the, the MFF will be revised, is, or is revised, there is a new proposal, so the multi-financial multi financial framework. Um, but there will be also a next generation EU program, which is basically a new recovery um, instrument um, with a firepower of 70, uh, 750 uh, billion. Um, this will be divided uh, in loans, but also uh, in grants, so non-repayable. Non um, if you go to the next slide, I can show you uh, the different pillars of the next uh, generation EU. This is a very helpful overview because we know that that uh, for many people the, uh, this is to, to find their way in the forest of all these measures, programs, instruments. Um, uh, a helpful overview might be might be sometimes necessary. So we see that basically next generation EU exists out of um, three different pillars. Um, the first pillar uh, is really to support uh, the member states themselves to recover. So this money will not be spent directly, as Matteo also partly explained, um, by the by the European Commission itself, but it will be allocated towards the member states. This is also what we what we uh, do, for example, in the in the structural funds, where we have a sort of a, a shared management, and shared management means that the money is allocated towards the member states, and they implement. Uh, the grants or the loans uh, in their in their respective uh, territory together with an operational program etc so the first pillar will uh, somehow work in the in the same in the same way um, you see that several programs are belonging to the first program the first one is the most important one is the recovery and resilience facility um, the second one is the recovery assistance for cohesion and territories of Europe so react EU um, will probably already be known. And then we have some dedicated focuses on rural development and just transition. Um, what is very important here is that this is connected to the European semester framework. So the, the yearly monitoring framework, economic monitoring framework, but also now um, discussions are ongoing to extend and, and to add also other, uh, let's say, indicators and KPIs to that framework. Uh, and this will be dedicated. This will be yearly reviewed uh, in, in national reform and, and recovery programs. So that is very uh, interesting and very. This is one of the biggest uh, aspects in, in terms of firepower. The second will specifically focus on kickstarting the economy. So restarting the economy and help really the, to generate uh, these private uh, investments. Therefore, it's really really important to work on solvency of, of companies. So therefore, a dedicated instrument will be there, uh, but also to do strategic investments, strategic sectors, st uh, strategic developments, uh, and strengthen the InvestEU program. The InvestEU program was already foreseen um, in, and has uh, four different pillars. So InvestEU is purely an investment program uh, with loan guarantees and direct investments and so on. But also very important is that we work on the capacity of these project pipelines. So there will be an advisory board. I think people who are following EVPA already for a time will know very well um, the engagement of EVPA, for example, because uh, in the, definitely in the social uh, investment and skills window, EVPA is, uh, is member of one of the GECAS expert working groups um, to how to implement one of the pillars of InvestEU. Um, but also this, um, let's say, InvestEU program will be an important uh, aspect to support key sectors, to um, also invest in, in, in these really key value chains. Uh, and as I said, as I started to, to, to really create solvency support uh, for viable companies to make them through um, the, the crisis and also to save, let's say, these vital companies, but also these key innovative uh, companies that, that will really uh, bring the, the, the future economy uh, in Europe 
uh, a boost uh, and and not um, for example prevent that there will be uh, that the uh, that there will be uh, mergers and acquisitions and that we will lose one of the uh, these these very important uh, value chains let's say a third one um, is as important as the other ones is really learning the lessons from this crisis and therefore we have also uh, specific programs for seen to support uh, these future uh, to support key programs in future crisis so when there is a new crisis that we are anticipating that we are not uh, waiting uh, to respond that we are ready um, just and and that's very important that that, uh, that we have learned already our lessons from the previous crisis in 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 the social economy itself we had a few webinars and i will go more in detail about that um, there were, uh, for example, ethical, social, and cooperative banks or financial intermediaries. That's an, um, if you compare to the previous private uh, crisis, now we had already the instruments to quickly react and to save uh, many of the social entrepreneurs out there with, for example, bridging loans, temporary uh, capital uh, loans. Uh, and to make them survive this crisis, which were not available before. So that means, and, and I think it's as important um, to to tell you and to explain that we are now reacting with new programs new initiatives but that also the previous ones are still working and that they also are working uh, very well of course left and right things should be reshaped should be reanalyzed um, the type of economic crisis is now um, completely different we have somehow an external shock right now um, so the the, the result um, will maybe uh, very similar uh, in the in the next few years um, but at at a short notice, the the, the impact is is ten times bigger than than we had before. So the again, we need to adapt to that. Um, if we go to the next slide, we see one of these new ways um, of of uh, of kickstarting, let's say, or uh, supporting the industries. And this is um, these are um, not looking at specific sectors uh, anymore. Uh, really uh, analyzing the whole value chain of a sector and adapting policy towards that. Therefore, uh, DG Grow has come up with um, industrial ecosystems. So, industrial ecosystem for rec for recovery and growth. Uh, we have assembled 14 critical ecosystems, um, which uh, will be the key for future investments and will, which will be also the key um, to build new networks, to build new innovations, to build also cross relationships between all these different ecosystems. And, and to be honest, we are very proud and very happy to, to show you that, that uh, this, this, this circle, because if you see on the left top, you see proximity and social economy as one of the 14 critical ecosystems because too much it's underestimated how important social economy social services um, the cooperative sector associations foundations uh, and mutuals and so on um, are how important they are for job generation but also in economic added value but even more really to to preserve the social added value that that that, that we create um, by 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 impact uh, by impact oriented uh, enterprises let's say um, if we go to the next slide thank you um, I will give you just uh, a short um, let's say insight and probably you will know uh, better even better than, than than we do what what the health bulletin of the social economy uh, ecosystem is and and how uh, the social economy suffered let's say from from the crisis in in, a, in let's say a very uh, immediate way uh, but also in the long term there are quite some risks um, so generally, uh, we have seen uh, that there is a huge drop in revenue for the social economy, comparable um, even to, to, for example, retail and to uh, the tourism sector, to creative uh, culture and arts, because many of these sectors are also represented with, among social entrepreneurs. So de facto, they are um, hit in, in, in the same manner um as as the sectors uh, or the ecosystems i have mentioned um just because there is a temporary cessation of of of, of their activities uh, certainly in the social services for example where there are many direct contacts between uh, the client or the target group and the people that are running uh, these uh, associations let's say um many are also at risk of a complete closure in, in the third and fourth term because we see that the let's say the there is a very limited financial stock so the reserves are very 
very limited in many uh, countries we get reports that uh, companies have only margin to survive uh, the current lockdown not the current but the lockdown we had for two maximum three months otherwise they would get bankrupt um, the social finance sector has uh, instruments to support the social economy as i already mentioned so that is really like a, a, a good that has been proven to be a good method to save in a very short time frame but of course um, we need over the longer run a mobilization of way more uh, capital influx within the social economy within social enterprises to give them also this economic boost and to get to really rewind the, the the losses they they have made um i i have shown in in this in this slide you will see um several um let's say uh, sectors or subsectors that we have identified i will this is not an, a complete picture of course but it, just to show you how for example the social services has suffered really a lot uh, thanks to uh, during this crisis but also the work integration enterprise uh, social enterprises uh, and as i said all, also uh, many social enterprises in specific sectors like retail tourism food creative industries um, and so on but there is also a positive aspect and and that is really important to highlight as well um, we have seen many innovations and um, a big resilience of some uh, business models in the social economy and first of all um, we, we would like to highlight the added value for example of uh, agriculture um, we have seen that in, in many uh, cities, regions, uh, small villages, the local sales of organic, ecologic farmers, short chain um, sales have, uh, have been boosted um, very much uh, through, for example, cooperative local markets, delivery at home, um, small farm shops. Um, if, for example, when distribution chains of big supermarkets were not trusted anymore or could not deliver um let's say the same quality so suddenly many citizens discovered a uh, very uh, near shops and, and and let's say agriculture products that were produced in proximity so that is something that we really should remind and, and revalue let's say and, and really support um a second one is is the digital social innovators that's very important to to stress that thanks to digital social innovation uh, to support uh, of cooperative platforms the digital commons as well um, many enterprises uh, mainstream businesses as well but also social enterprises suddenly improved their digital presence their digital identity they were able to um, to shift very quickly their their way of, of producing but not only producing but selling through e-commerce to build by building platforms um, establishing e-communication and services um, we have also discovered many tools that were discovered specifically for the social economy sector by social entrepreneurs um, and that were actually tailored for their type of businesses very low cost very easy usable um, and I can I can I can bring you uh, to, to some very interesting links that that are sh that are showing that that such a crisis brings very critical and very fast innovations that make a difference for for even the smallest business out there um, and and the last point I want to highlight is um, the fixing of disrupted value chains so um, social economy has showed uh, really the added value in bringing these these basic goods in the local community when other value chains were completely uh, disrupted stuck um, not only in terms of food but also in terms of mobility services uh, suddenly we saw uh, taxi cooperatives jumping in for older people to bring them to hospitals etc uh, many work integration social enterprises started suddenly to um, to produce masks but also other productive um, uh, protection material um, even uh, very high-end medical products were uh, assembled and produced by um, uh, by digital commons that shared the protocols and so on and so on um, and then my last uh, slide um, will highlight something very specifically that uh, will probably in interest for for the the audience of, of of an EVPA policy seminar, uh, and that is some type of uh, new finance uh, schemes that uh, really were boosted. Um, and it's a bit disrespectful, for example, to highlight um, 
um, let's say uh, the new type uh, or to call it new types of finance uh, for example because crowdfunding is known for many years is already very popular in the impact investing world uh, but also in the community finance um, match funding is not that known yet but maybe amongst your circles it's, it's quite known but what we have seen is that many um, businesses found also new resources in terms of donations but also in terms of investment capital thanks to these very local initiatives. So one trend for example that, that is remarkable and, and unfortunately there is not yet enough evidence about it but in, so it's more let's say anecdotal evidence that we have so far is that there um, was uh, that that the equity based crowdfunding was uh, in, in the first stage was less attractive so people really wanted to or to invest in very local initiatives and very local companies um, and that was basically because of this urgency factor um, so that is something that was not notable on, on a short term but in the longer term that brought them also closer to to this new type of financial platforms this new type of, of community um, let's say financial uh, resources um, and then I come to the match funding which is is um, which might be a, a great tool also, for example, to support uh, over time with, with in, InvestEU or other financial instruments, and which will also be um, a, potentially possible within uh, to be supported by, by uh, European instruments. Match funding is basically very uh, simple, bringing different uh, origin of financial, financial resources together. But what is crucial um, is that there is a very strong local element. Um, so, for example, a foundation can invest, uh, local government can invest, a local SME can invest, but what is crucial is that it's usually also combined with the crowdfunding aspect. So there is a verification of a community to invest in a certain uh, business, but also just a community service. And there is a, ver a, a very broad critical mass that supports this, and it's always related to the local, uh, to a sort of local ownership model. Um, it's very simple. It's just one euro, one euro, one euro. You can have very uh, different modus operandi, but this is really a promising tool for very small local social businesses, for very local uh, social services projects, whatever. And and I think that also from from the impact investing world, because you can have match funding in, in a sort of uh, donation base, as I said, but you can also transfer to 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 more equity uh, alike uh, methods. Um, just to wrap up, um, this is one of the aspects that we have been discussing in, in seven uh, webinars in social economy uh, in response to COVID-19. If you want to find more about it, I, I will share uh, the link afterwards with EVPA, who you see here, uh, one of the, the a few of the presentations that were made in our online session. Uh, of different match funding, crowdfunding initiatives, specifically in the fight against COVID-19, but that brought a lot of attention to these type of, of mechanisms to the audience. Um, so that is what I wanted to share with you. Um, thank you very much for your attention and good luck. Thank you very much, Karel. Uh, now I would like to leave the floor to Christina. Please, Christina, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank EVPA and European Commission for organizing this webinar and inviting us to participate as uh, practitioners. And before addressing the, the question about how as a practitioner we have faced the different challenges of this pandemic and what lessons we have learned, let me talk a little bit about the context. Uh, the COVID has been really a tragedy, but we already had some tragedies in our lives. Regarding the climate change, for example, uh, we know that we are the last generation that can save our planet. We know that millennials are pushing, no, Greta with all her movement and so on. We also have the refugee crisis and so many other social crises. And now we also have the, the COVID pandemic. So in C2B, we used to think that impact revolution was really necessary, but now it's more than ever. And we think that this is the, the unique solution or at least one good solution. So we think that social entrepreneurship and impact investment and also working with corporates around shared value uh, could help a lot in this crisis. And we work from, for bringing together these two aspects, social impact and economic and financial return and trying not to separate them as we used to, to do in the, in the past. 
So before sharing the challenge and the lessons we have faced and learned, uh, let me introduce you to ship 2 be a little bit. As in the introduction, EBPA has said, we are a foundation that fosters social entrepreneurship and impact investment in the Spanish ecosystem. And our mission is to demonstrate that impact is profitable. To implement our mission, we work with multiple stakeholders. As you can see in the slide, we work with impact startups and also with non-profits and social economy. We have different acceleration programs for different types of projects and for different types of challenges. We work in the health and social challenge, in the climate change, in the education and employment challenge, and so on. We also work with the corporate world. We are convinced that they are going to be a key agent and we, we want to, to have them in, in our role. And we offer them different corporate impact venturing services and we try to connect them with these impact startups and, and make them to, to collaborate. And regarding the investors, we also collaborate with them in order to, to offer financial support to our network of projects. And we work with different types of investors, from investors with impact that maybe are, are focused more on profitability apart from having an impact. And we also have some investors more for impact using the EBPA terminology, you know, foundations or uh, high net worth individuals that uh, don't mind to reduce a little bit the profitability if they are, they are sure that we are having a, a real and measured social impact. And finally, we also we, we have been uh, pushing the ecosystem in Spain the last seven years because we, we think that, that we have to try to, to build a, a stronger ecosystem. And here we, we organize a, the impact event, I think, in Spain, the Impact Forum. And this year is going to be fully online. So if you want to join us, it would, it would be grateful. Uh, next slide, please. Here you have some, some figures. I'm not going to stop here. I only want to share with you that we, we are seven years old and we are 25 people in the team now. So more or less, we are a, a medium a startup or foundation. And next slide, please. And entering a little bit in detail in our main programs, uh, focusing on the project side. The first one is the sip 2 be Health and Care. Uh, the second one is this Tech for Climate. These both programs look for startups uh, that try to solve a social or environmental problem that measure impact and usually are technologically based and they want to scale and to be profitable. No? So maybe these are projects that are invested by investors with impact and they don't, uh, how do you say, they don't reduce the profitability, but they also want a social impact. So we want to offer them both, both sides of the, of the coin, let's say. And in the next slide, you can see that we also have some programs uh, regarding the social or the non-profit entities and also the social economy that, as you know, in Spain is, is huge and uh, has, has played a, a, a very big role in the, in the past. So in the B value, we work with NGOs, foundations uh, and so on trying to, to push them to be more innovative, to start to think about business models and trying to help them to measure better their, their impact. So working with these social entities that are more accustomed to grants uh, and probably they are going to, to, to stand there and they are going to ask for grants in the future but we want them to try to think out of the box and maybe be more sustainable. Uh, but let's say that this is a program that is more uh, focused on, on the non-profit world. And this Rethinkers for Impact uh, is the last program we have, we have um, started. This is a pilot, we, we are doing it now. And this is an acceleration of funding program that is a little bit different uh, from other programs we have and other stakeholders have in Spain. Because here we are, we are trying to solve employment and education challenges that have been mentioned by the other panelists today. Now with COVID crisis, we think that this challenge is even more important than ever. And we want to try to prove that venture philanthropy is the right investment strategy for this type of projects. 
and we want to channel private financing different from grants to them. So this is the first this, uh, the first edition. We are having the first results and it is uh, it is uh, working. We have seen that in other countries, for example, in the UK, we have access doing something similar and we want to grow it in Spain for 2021. So uh, after this short introduction to the context and C2B, now I would like to share some insights about how we as practitioners have lived this pandemic and how are we going to address the, the near future. So the first decision uh, we made was following with all of our programs and projects, boosting and supporting the impact ecosystem. And the second one was adapting all of our programs to online. It's true that we used to work in blended formats before, but it has been really a challenge to adapt everything to, to fully online. And also we used to telework some days uh, during the month, but it, it has been a challenge to adapt everything again to, to telework every day. And in the near future, we are going to try to make the most of these changes and we are going to, to offer more blended uh, programs and we are going to telework more. So regarding some specific actions, one thing I would like to, to underline is that we, we, are, we have been very active in the portfolio management because some of our investees were preparing investment rounds when COVID came or some of them uh, needed liquidity during the, the crisis. So we, we have been very focused uh, trying to help them with both things and, and we know that some of them um, have said to us that we have been a key agent because uh, they were like uh, in a hurry and maybe if, if we couldn't uh, help them pues they, they don't have access to all this investment network. Uh, other thing we decided uh, was to celebrate different virtual seminars with all of our stakeholders and try to keep in touch permanently. Next slide, please. Or, or previous one, I don't know. Maybe it's the previous one. Yes, I am still here. Thank you. Um, and the third thing was to try to, to, to detect the, the special initiatives startups were, were thinking. And there were, there were different startups in March, April in Spain trying to, to solve the problem of ventilators, respirators, because we didn't have enough in our state. And we tried to, to play a catalytic role because they were working uh, in different places, in different geographies, with different approaches. And we tried to, to make the most of this intermediary position and try to connect them and try to order a little bit the, the traffic. And finally, we have uh, collaborated with all the ecosystem. Uh, Karel uh, finished his intervention showing us some crowdfunding initiatives around Europe. And I and I have um, checked that there is one that we that we uh, help here in Spain uh, with La Bolsa Social. So this is a, a good example, no? Uh, uh, the ecosystem in Spain of social entrepreneurship and impact investment is still relatively small. It, it's growing quickly, but more or less we know each other. Uh, we have uh, been very connected and try to to make the most of us connected to help the social enterprises and, and social economy. And regarding the digitalization, uh, I think that the, the most important thing we have uh, tried to, to do is to convert this, this impact forum that usually um, uh, access to 1,000 people in Barcelona every year we are trying to transform it entirely online and we think it's going to be in November and now we are quite uh, happy to announce that uh, it will it will happen and we think it, it will it will be a good opportunity to have uh, more European assistance so so let's see so uh, next slide please uh, until here, uh, I have more or less tried to sum up uh, what seemed to be decided to do directly. But we have a lot of things that we want to, to, to share with you that are uh, the response uh, from different agents from our community. For example, if you go to the next slide, here I, I have uh, 
collecting some examples of our investees, no? Uh, they have been really agile and they, they, they have been focused, uh, first of all, uh, to, to be there, no? to try to maximize impact in a situation that, that was really uh, necessary. And at the same time, they, are, uh, really, they have been really focused on, on ensuring the, the financial sustainability, no? the, the both sides of the coin again. For example, Cuida um, is a startup that has reduced pressure on the care system by offering a safe at home alternative. In, and at the same time, uh, they have uh, been focused on creating quality employment for, for careers. No? Uh, for example, Fiction Express, uh, this is in the edu education sector, has opened its platform uh, for free to support the students learn and read from home. No? Or, for example, World Cup uh, has uh, tried again, again crowdfunding, more or less, has channeled micro donations to fund research and to mitigate the effects of the, of the pandemic, above all among the most vulnerable groups. So, this is the response of our investees or accelerated startups. In the next slide, you can see that the non profit world and social economy uh, has been there too. They, are, they once again have demonstrated that they are really key in providing direct care uh, for the most vulnerable. And we have a group them, they, they have been working, as I think Carol said too, uh, in the, the digitalization, in the daily telematic monitoring no, of people that are living in, in, in really uh, difficult conditions. They have uh, transformed all their trainings and services to online, and even uh, some social economy ent entities have, have seen that their lines of actions uh, were stopped or yes, or sometimes even closing, and they have uh, been brave enough and focused enough to refocus them. For example, Leia Slobordan is a, an integration company here in Spain, in, in Madrid, that um, used to produce textile products, different textile products for, for different corporates, and they started to, to produce masks to help uh, hospitals, and now they, are, they, have been, they have opened a new line, and they even sell masks for, for, for us, no? for, for the people in the street. In, in the next slide, you, you can see that even corporates uh, of our network uh, have, have been working hard to, to have a, a role also in this, in this pandemic. No? Maybe we can, we can underline uh, things uh, like um, an app that the KV Seguros Medicos has been pushing uh, for the people that were at home and needed uh, medical assistance I, and it was not a very, very urgent situation. So they put this, this app to help people uh, through the app, no? trying to, to accompany a little bit the people and, and also uh, giving some good um, advice, advising. Uh, then we have resource sharing. For, for example, Catalonia Hotels put some beds and rooms available for the treatment uh, for patients, or Nestlé, for example, uh, showing solidarity and collaborating a lot with non-profits and, and food banks. No? In the next slide, I have uh, put the investors. Here is the, the initiative I mentioned before that I saw in the slide of Karel um, one moment ago. This is the call all of the impact investors in Spain, you can see their La Bolsa Social, you can see SIP2B, you can see Open Value Foundation. Uh, all of them uh, joined and, and made this call to finance startups facing coronavirus, a specific call for these, for these startups that were working in the middle of the, of the pandemic. And in the last one, I have tried to to put some examples that, that are good, good examples of the whole ecosystem. No? For example, this Creating for Humanity is a platform that we open with a lot of uh, partners, for example, Ashoka or Mondragon Team Academy, and we try to put uh, all together the different acceleration programs or 
um, crisis or whatever uh, were happening around COVID. And we put here the focus more on the youth because we were convinced that youth people that were at home, maybe in their universities years or starting to work, they wanted to help also and maybe it was a good moment to spread this social entrepreneurship concept and try to to attract them to this to this field so if you go to the next one i am finishing and at, until here I, I have tried to explain you what ship to be did, did uh, personally and what the ecosystem of ship to be did i think uh, all of them uh, i suppose it has been the same in everywhere all people all partners all startups wanted to do something uh, the same as us and now uh, we have been reflecting about the future and about the road ahead and we we have decided that we have to follow with more energy commitment and passion than ever with all of our programs because we are convinced as i, as I have said in the beginning that we have to spread this impact revolution and we have to be there to try to, to push no? the, the ecosystem and, and help every actor uh, from, from its point of view. Uh, at the same time, we want to leverage this digital transformation as a fast track and try to, to gain our mission uh, more quickly if we can. And finally, um, sharing worries and insights with the previous panelists, uh, we would like to reinforce our commitment with this specific challenge of education and employment. Because as you can see in the next slide, in our country, this, this uh, theme of employment uh, has been a problem during, during the last years. Uh, we, we have recovered a lot from the previous crisis, but it's still something that pre previous COVID was a thing that we have in our agenda and now with COVID even more. So we have decided not only to finish this pilot I mentioned before around education and around employment, uh, but also try to, to grow it and try to put this axis of work in the same place uh, we have climate change or health and social uh, area. And if we move uh, to the next slide, uh, you can you can see here some some insights uh, not only from the point of view of the results of the pilot I mentioned before but also because I am currently in the middle of my PhD with Lisa Hechenberger that maybe most of them know 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 her because she used to work for for EDPA and she works with European Commission also now she's in Esade and we are trying to analyze the financing needs of the social entrepreneurship projects in Spain and the results we are getting confirm these two conclusions I'm going to share with you and, and, and are the same uh, from the pilot. So we see that in this uh, field of social economy or, or a little bit more impact first projects, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, seen that there is a need of more technical assistance because mm, this type of entrepreneurs more impact first or or more social economy oriented are really really worried about the social problem they are tackling uh, they are worried about the beneficiaries but sometimes they don't uh, know how to measure impact really well or they they know how to measure but then they they get lost when they try to manage uh, the businesses regarding the impact and they don't know how, uh, how, how to maximize it in, in the proper way. Uh, and even more important, uh, here in Spain, we have noticed that some of them uh, lack some capacities uh, or some skills around strategy, innovation, business model. So we think that maybe they, they apply uh, only for grants because they don't know how to take a look and try to, 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 to think about business models, sustainability or even profitability. So we, we are included, including this technical assistance in this program with a with lot of hours, let's say, and with, with some intensivity. And at the same time, as I mentioned before, we are trying to explore these new financial instruments, for example, soft loans or patient capital, that they start to think that maybe uh, could be a good instrument for them because the more 
impact investment funds we have in Spain that maybe uh, are more focused on the short term or, or ask for a, a high yield uh, are really far away from this type of projects that are working in this field of education and unemployment. And that's all. Thank you very much. I will be delighted to answer any questions you may have. Um, please do not hesitate to contact me. You can find my details here. And um, thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Cristina, for this detailed uh, presentation. Very interesting. And now we can start with, with the Q&A session. And I leave the floor to my colleague, Catalina. Thank you, Bianca. Uh, our audience was quite active today. So uh, during this session, we received some questions linked uh, both to the social enterprises, reaction on COVID-19 pand pandemic, but also on the SHARE program. Uh, Carol, Matteo, and Cristina, is it fine if I address uh, one question for uh, each of you? And then if we have more time, we can delve more into, into the topic. Of course, yes, uh, of course. Yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm. The first one is more related to the timeline of the EU funding, specifically uh, for Matteo. Is there any deadline until the countries will have to contribute with their guarantees? um no there is no deadline uh just let me clarify that the um, the countries are not supposed to pay in any cash they just sign a guarantee agreement uh where basically they commit to provide this uh guarantee uh which is secured um, and callable and uh, etc uh, but there is no paid in cash uh, capital is required at the beginning um, but let me reassure you that it's just a matter of days or weeks. So we expect this process to be concluded um, by mid-July, uh, roughly. And uh, so all member states are aware of the need to make this instrument operational as soon as possible, and they're doing what they can. At the same time, you know, national... <laughs> procedures have to be respected and uh, and um, and as I mentioned this includes the, the in some member states a vote by the parliament and this takes time um, but so no member state is dragging their feet some some member states have already uh, signed the, these guarantee agreements um, we are just waiting for the for the last ones and uh, so uh, in principle the, the the instrument should become active soon okay thank you and maybe we can stick also for the second question uh, regarding sure as it is quite important has sure instrument a territorial distribution more specific is there a quota reserved for each member state uh, that's an important question a uh, simple answer is no there is no predetermined quota um, uh, there is only uh, well, there are basically two ceilings. One is the overall envelope, which is 100 billion maximum. And then there is a concentration uh, limit, uh, but basically because the, 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 the Commission, the Union, European Union, needs to divers diversify its risks, let's say. So the three largest loans altogether cannot exceed 60 billion, so 60% of the overall envelope. So that's the only two. Uh, effective limits. Uh, then, of course, the, a member state can only will be able to request uh, support, uh, so uh, um, financial assistance uh, for actual expenditure, which is uh, which has uh, already been realized starting from the first of February, or also planned expenditure, which expenditure which has not taken place yet, but it's in the pipeline. Uh, so this could in, can include, you know, the existing programs which will continue to run uh, in the coming months, or possibly also new mm, programs that uh, uh, national measures that the member some member states may be introducing now or are planning to introduce now. So the instrument, the support can be requested both um, looking at the past expenditure as of first of February. That was the the starting date. Let's say when we consider that from that moment onwards we can start seeing the, the effects of the COVID-19 crisis on the economy and the labor market and also uh, with a forward-looking element. 
So potentially country can request any amount provided that it's backed by actual expenditure incurred or planned. And, uh, and then it's you know, uh, within the limits, in particular the concentration requirement. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Uh, Carol, for you, we have a question uh, related to the institutionalizing of learnings. Does the Commission intend to inst institutionalize all the learnings on match and crowdfunding observed in this period and stimulate this financial mechanism in the future? Aha, that's a $1 million question, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, let it me state like, like this. So um, the, the, in, the initial InvestEU um, proposal is, is fairly open to, um, to such initiatives, but um, this is of course not enough. There should be also, let's say, a decent demand from the market itself to, to um, make this true. So a match funding instrument itself, it speaks for, yeah, it speaks for itself. You need several parties um, to enter the game and therefore it's also very important that um, let's say crowdfunding platforms but also organizations like EPPA foundations um, get more interested in such techniques and, and such structures to, to also provide the, the appropriate infrastructure to run such things because we see that it, it happens and that is the, 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 the difficult issue over here is that many of these um, let's say instruments are used very locally so the stretch between EU and the local level might be might be quite uh, a far shot but but nevertheless it, there is there is definitely uh, the possibility and the opportunity in, in the invest you what I didn't mention and that's not relevant for this discussion but I think it's very interesting to know is that the, also the invest you proposal is, is uh, re revised huh? so and there is now also a proposal for a fifth window the budget the budget increased mm -hmm. um, so the fifth window will be the, the European investment uh, a strategic European investment window I'm sorry so that that brings uh, an, another angle in recovery but that, that has nothing specifically to do with with the crowdfunding and match fund um, but but the, the main response to that question is that Yes, there are definitely possibilities. The pipelines are not um, ready yet. Huh? So first we need to have an agreement on, on, on the budget uh, and on InvestEU itself. But afterwards it might be it might be possible if the, there is also sufficient partnership in, in the market to develop such uh, pipelines and, and to develop su such schemes, yes. And, and to, to finish, um, there is not even a limit to invest EU. It might also be applied by by other uh, instruments. For example, in the structure of funds, there is also a possibility to work uh, in, in 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 such a fashion. So that um, I know that some management authorities are exploring the opportunity to to establish such funding principles, rather donation based and then. Uh, in, in, in terms of equity, but um, I would not limit uh, it only to uh, to the InvestEU uh, scheme, let's say. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Christina, you were talking in your presentation about uh, the community, your community, the ship to be community response. And one of the questions that we received um, asked you or approached which type of members have you, uh, of your members, face the most challenging interaction with, and which one do you consider were the most hardly hit by the COVID-19 crisis and why? Yes, I think uh, regarding the first aspect, I think that um, the impact the startups and the social entities, both of them uh, were really affected uh, by the COVID because the impact startups are starting their journeys no? because we accelerate startups in the initial phases and then we invest in really precede phases so so they are in a moment that are not really a stable project so a pandemic or a crisis uh, is a, uh, a difficult situation no and social entities and non-profit world um, they always uh, face the the crisis uh, in really hard conditions, I think, because they, they really work with the most vulnerable people, even we don't have a crisis. So in a crisis, they they are like over, over, no, over, yes, over, well, so I think this, this group of, uh, of stakeholders have been the, 
the, the most attack. And that's why we try to be really uh, near from them. I, I remember a, a special webinar with with the nonprofits, and it was really difficult because uh, there are some things that are really uh, difficult to, to solve uh, from one day to another. But uh, giving a, a more positive uh, impression, or I don't know, a little bit of yes like future, uh, it was astonishing how in this hard situation they they found um, a strength in I don't know where and, and they overcome the obstacles. So I think if I have to, to congratulate uh, some of them, I think it's, it's more the non-profit and social economy and, and at the same time these impact the startups in the first phases, yes. Okay, thank you. I think we have uh, time for one more question. And um, we want to address to you again, Christina. Uh, okay. Have the local or national public authorities had any role in your activities fighting against the COVID-19 crisis? And have you interacted with uh, any national or local government in your in initiatives? Okay, as I have said before, the, the ecosystem in Spain is quite young, let's say. Uh, it was a, a good moment uh, last year in June, one year ago, we, we joined the Global Steering Group a group, let's say, no? these 20, more than 20 countries that are working with Sir Ronald Cohen, uh, fostering the, the social entrepreneurship and impact investment. And in this uh, in this period, we we all of the agents we work together and and how do you say order the ecosystem, no? And in the in the final part, we we went to the public administration because we are really aware that we need our national public administration to to make this ecosystem bigger, no? As as we have listened today, it's very common that a European Commission uh, address the funds. Uh, through the national public authorities. So we, we have been working with them in the national and regional level because I live in the Basque country and this is, uh, we have a, an administration that also has uh, some power. And I think they are really quite near, but maybe they are not uh, so stable in this new ecosystem. So I think uh, we are in the same page, but we, we have work to be done uh, from both sides to, to, to collaborate more. And regarding the COVID, there have been specifically, uh, there have been a lot of public initiatives and, and we have been uh, connected, but I, I, even again, we, we are connected, we talk each other, but we, are, we haven't uh, proposed something together, or I can remember now. Okay, perfect. Good to know for, for the future. Uh, this was our last question. Uh, thank you so much to all the participants for actively addressing questions. And of course, many thanks uh, to our speakers of today for their presentations and very clear answers. Um, it was a very interesting exchange of knowledge, useful for all of us to better understand the mechanism through which both public and private stakeholders can counter the economic fallout and to mitigate negative social aspects brought by COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, joining our forces to repair, as uh, all of you said, uh, to repair the social damage brought by the coronavirus pandemic has never been more important than now. Public sector and European institutions, as well as private actors are supporting stakeholders and more specifically investors road to impact after the crisis. And uh, as Christina told us, she to be the concrete example of this. EVPA acknowledges the importance of the European institution's quick reaction and the flexibility in funds proposed by the Commission. The flexibility of the Commission and the quick adaptation are strongly visible not only through the emergency temporary recovery instrument, sure, but also through all the planning of the next multi-annual financial framework. Venture philanthropists and the social investors across Europe have also quickly responded to the outbreak of the pandemic, expressing solidarity with social purpose organizations and beneficiaries by supporting them with financial contributions and technical assistance. By being part of the Unitus Europe Hub with another four networks, EVPA supports innovation, collaboration and solidarity, contributing to the recovery post-COVID-19. 
This hub was created with the aim of being a valuable space for sharing information, resources, and good practices to inspire other actors gaining new insights through peer learning and identifying opportunities on the demand and supply side. Through Unitus Europe, EVPA aims to support and give guidance to suppliers of funding, such as foundations, social investors, and public funders throughout the survival or the revival phases related to the COVID-19 crisis, with a focus of trans on transnational and cross-border activities in Europe and beyond. On the final note, we would like to invite all of you to the next webinar on the 19th of, 9th of December, sorry, which will cover the topic on the European Green Deal, just transition, the role of social investors uh, under these topics. Uh, I would like to remind you also that the recording of this webinar with all the slides will be available soon on our website. And finally, that a survey will pop up on your screen. We will highly appreciate if you can get two minutes to fill it in, as it is a very good opportunity for us to understand what other policy topics will be interesting for you to address in the upcoming webinar. Thank you for attending and uh, have a very, very nice evening.